Welcome everybody to Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels here from the Santa Monica Studios and our guest on this week's show to break down a truly epic 2022 Australian Open. Former British number one, 15 titles to his name, now works for Amazon Prime covering, covering tennis. It's Greg Ruzetsky making his second appearance on the show. Greg, thanks for joining Tennis Channel Inside In. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, what a start to the year we've had. I mean, you couldn't ask for more drama at the Australian Open in both the men's and the women's. So we've got a lot to talk about today. We do. We do. I know you've got some great memories of Australia yourself, the tournament that starts the year uh, and how well it could set your season up. I mean, taking you back personally, what was it? 2001, you had that fourth round run, you knock off Curtin, the top player in the world, and you kind of get the sense that a start there could really set you up for a great season. If, if above all else, it just gives you confidence going forward that you can hit the ground running. It does definitely, you know, and also winning a few lead up events as well. I usually won in Auckland or I played well in Adelaide. And if you play well at the lesser events coming into the majors, you know, that gives you the confidence and sets up the year. And boy, this Australian Open has set up so many storylines, you know, the old guard, the new generation popping through what's going to happen in men's tennis. So uh, we couldn't have asked for more this year. Yeah, let's see. What is there to talk about? Off the top of my head, is there any uh, groundbreaking historical uh, epic matchups? So well, we could talk about the men's final where Rafael Nadal wins his second Australian Open, his record setting 21st Grand Slam. First since 2009, he beats Daniil Medvedev in five sets. Greg, I mean, he was dead to rights. He was down two sets to love. He was love 40 on his serve. And taking into account everything that he'd went through in the lead up and the matches, the Shapovalov match where he was battling the conditions. Medvedev is a younger, fitter player coming off of the Grand Slam at the U.S. Open. How, how could Rafael Nadal come back and win this match, let alone given what he had gone through? Yeah, he, he's a genetic freak of nature. And also his mental fortitude is second to none. If you wanted one guy playing for your life for one match, he's your man. I mean... What he has done is sensational because we've got to go a little bit of backstory here as well. Let's not forget in September, the picture on the crutches. I mean, he wasn't putting any weight on that foot we're talking about. Comes out, starts the year, wins two events in Melbourne, the lead up tournament, then the Australian Open to win his 21st slam. And before the Australian Open started in January, my two picks were Djokovic for the title and Ash Barty for the title. I wasn't even putting Rafa in the equation. The other guys we're talking about was Medvedev, you know, being the second favorite. We're talking about Sasha Zverev, but Rafa just went gangbusters. And as you said, two sets down, love 40, 3-2. We're thinking, this is curtains. There's no way he's getting back. But Rafa just showed us the fortitude to fight. Also, let's not forget that crowd. I mean, that crowd was insane how much they were behind Rafa wanting to see history happen as well. So for me, probably his greatest accomplishment in his career. Yes, we can talk about 13 French Opens, which will never be broken. But this in itself against Daniil Medvedev was truly amazing. Yeah, I would agree with that one singular accomplishment. It's this. I mean, the totality of 13 Grand Slams at the same one is is insane. But he even said after the match, Greg, that he was just trying to say, you know, basically screw it, F it. I got to just keep fighting and keep going to the end. And I mean, it's one thing to say that and the, the mental side of tennis is it's one game at a time. It's one little momentum at a time. When he held that serve, he kind of turned it around. And when he, when he won that third set, I started to notice that belief pick up. You mentioned the crowd. I mean, he had to just enjoy the shoe kind of being on the other foot from what five years prior when the crowd wanted Roger to win that match against him. Now he's the fan favorite. That belief really started to show itself. And he had that look in his eye, that classic Rafa look where he realized that, you know what, I can wear this guy down and needed some help doing it, but it was just a remarkable performance. Well, the thing is, you've got to look at the age difference as well. Rafa's 35, Daniil's 25. That's 10 years in difference. And after that third set, as you said, I mean, Daniil looked like he was exhausted. He's having his legs massaged. He was drinking the pickle juice, which they say is trying to stop you from cramping out there. And Rafa, he can just dig into an area that nobody else can dig in. And he knows how to time manage as well. A lot of people don't understand how he uses the rules to his advantage as well. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody as intense since probably Jimmy Connors. Jimmy Connors in the generation prior was the man. Rafa is the man of the moment. And I, I just have to say the points, the break points saved, the 
game points won by Rafa at the key moments in those final three sets were amazing because let's not forget, he also served for the match and had to serve it out a second time to get the job done. So he probably went against the toughest test in men's tennis apart from Novak Djokovic. You know, we can talk about just how miraculous it is and, and, and how marvelous it is to watch the depth he gets on his forehand and the footwork running around it and, and all that stuff. But you mentioned the serve. I mean, from the second set on, I think he was only about 55% or so on his first serve in the first two sets. That number skyrocketed into the 70s, 80%. And I think one of the things that gets lost in the shuffle with his greatness is his ability to change tactics, figure it out, problem solve on, on its own. He realized pretty early in my estimation, Greg, that he could come to net. He could shorten these points. He didn't want to be out there all day with Medvedev. And I just think the ability to change tactics is something that doesn't get enough credit, respect for Rafa's side. No, I, I would agree with you on that as well. And then also he realized that all the second serves were going to his backhand side in that uh, third, fourth, and fifth set. So not only the service percentage went up, the realization that the second serves were 100% of the time going to the backhand side and taking them on a little bit more, which allowed him to get his forehand into play because in the first two sets, he wasn't being able to get his forehand into play at all. So if you look at those combinations, the very greats, you wonder whether they feel it or they know it. And that's the question I would love to ask to say Rafa, Roger, and Novak. Do you feel it? Do you know the numbers? Does Carlos Moyer, your coach, call out something? How do you make this miraculous change when you know the guy's on fumes finding a solution? On fumes is a way to put it. Nearly five hours of playing tennis and he wins. And I'm glad you brought up Moya. He's done such a great job been a great addition to his team. Uh, on the flip side of this, I mean, it's a tough one for Medvedev. Uh, he loses it from two sets up, is the younger player, was going for his second slam. And the comments in the post-match press conference where he said he's basically going to start playing for himself and his family and, and his country and saying that that kid that dreamed growing up, it's, it's, it's gone basically. I know it stings. I know losing a tough match is never easy, and there's a lot of fresh wounds after the moment. But, Greg, what do you think about his post-match conference, press conference and the words after the match? Well, I think probably in retrospect, he'll probably think differently. You know, when you've lost a match like that, had to deal with a crowd. I mean, he basically had his support box cheering for him in those final three sets. And, uh, you know, he's kind of like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. And I'm a big Daniil Medvedev fan. I think, you know, he's good for tennis. He's one of the few guys who said, I'm going to stand up physically to Rafa. I'm going to stand up physically to Novak. And, you know, we need personalities that aren't the politically correct, giving us the nice quotes all the time. And that's why we're talking about it today. So for my opinion, it's good to have different opinions out there, but I'm sure he'll do what he did when he got to New York in 2019, got the crowd jeering him, won the match and then turned it around. And I think he'll probably retract those comments in a little bit of time in a different manner. Yeah. First off, I mean, when you lose a match like that, I don't really take into account some of the things, even some of the stuff that Shapovalov said after his loss to Rafa, like it's fresh, you're upset. I get it. I'll give you a pass. Hey, there. we've all said <laughs> stupid things. I mean, yeah. myself included. I mean, yeah. I remember I played Sampras in 2002. Guys, a step and a half slow. You know, everybody's saying in the locker room, I should have won the match. I don't think he's going to win the tournament. What does Pete do? The great won the tournament for his last U.S. Open. So we have all said stupid things in our career, whether you're Shapovalov, yeah. Medvedev, whoever you are. With, with Rafa and Roger, yeah. they've not really done that. I mean, that's a miracle to be able to do that throughout your whole career. You got a nice little assist on that, or at least a hockey assist on that in terms of helping Pete win that title. <laughs> with the motivation. Uh, but no, I, I agree. And I think your point is right. It's we need people like this that are different. It's, it's hard to be like Novak Djokovic and just completely zone out and, and, and no matter what the crowd is saying, but I agree. It's good to have different personalities in the game. The, the addition to that I would add is to also have the, have them get the results. Like Nick Kyrgios is a name that gets brought up, but Medvedev going deep into these tournaments is key to that as well, because you can't just be, you know, the contrary and the, the outlaw, you have to actually produce too, which Medvedev has done. Well, he does. And, you know, the moment he sat down with his coach a few years and the coach said to him, uh, Jill Savara, you're not working hard enough. You're not putting the time enough on the court. You know, you got to physically break down players. And that's what he's done. You got to give the guy credit. He won the U.S. Open last year back in the finals. This match was huge for him. We're talking about Rafa getting 21 slams, which is the all time record. But if Medi won, he was number one in the world and he would have won back to back majors two in a row. I mean, we're talking about 
can anybody win a major with, you know, the big three, Murray and Vavrinka? Who else is going to win one? And he was so close. Imagine if he would have won. He'd have been number one, two slams in a row. He's going to be the guy to look out for the future. So this was huge for him. So you got to look at that point. And as you said, Nick Curios, you know, it's great he won the doubles, but I wish he put the effort on the singles court like Daniil does. And that's one thing I, I respect him tremendously for. Yeah, still seems to be the guy. I mean, he beats it to pass again. Zverev struggled at the slams. He's still the guy of that generation that's made the most headway, though others are kind of making their move as well. And just a final note on Rafa. I mean, you, you hear the reaction and, and the fact that he's at peace with his place in the game and, and how he accomplishes the things he does. He just loves the process. And now with his schedule being the key factor as he gets up there in age, you get the sense that there's not, you know, we're not done with him winning tournaments. He's going to be in the mix going forward. That's the scary thing. 21 majors. And yet the, the cliff isn't here yet. No, the cliff isn't here. And you know, there's two guys going for the cliff right now. And I would say that's Djokovic and Adele. Mark my words, end of 2022, we're going to have 22 slams, Rafa, 22 Novak. Wow. Wow. So I, I think, yeah. you know, this is going to get even more exciting. The next generation of Medis, Verev, the Chapos, the Ozer Alias seems those guys are going to get into the mix, but I still think the battle Royale is on right now. And Rafa has to be the favorite for the French open coming up. He has to be the man. Well, Djokovic has got to be, you know, upset about the whole situation down under thinking, okay, I should win Wimbledon this year. I should win the U S open. So uh, I think this is going to be an amazing year. Yeah. With, with these guys, Rafa, especially showing in this tournament, it's just, you can do all the X's and O's and break down the match and who's younger, who has, but, but you have to finish the guy off and it's who can do it. Who can knock him out in a best of five with his mental strength is crazy. Uh, I do want to mention you brought him up. Novak Djokovic, his reaction, he's starting to kind of just get past how tough it was in Australia with what happened and said, he's going to you know tell his story in the week to come. But what should we expect the next time he picks up a racket? Because this is a guy who, Whenever there's been adversity, there hasn't been, you know, as much, but whenever there's been adversity, he's dialed back in and played some of his best tennis. So should we expect that when he hits the court again this month? Oh, yeah. He's going to have the bit between his teeth. There's no question about it. To me, I've seen him do things on a tennis court nobody else has done. I mean, I, I bring back that match 2017 against Federer at the U.S. Open. I was there live on the court, and he had 22,500 people against him apart from his support box didn't make him flinch or bother him whatsoever against one of the all-time greats. So Djokovic wants to go down as the greatest male tennis player in the history of sport and probably even break Margaret Court's record of 24 majors. So uh, I think the next tournament he plays where he's going to be allowed to play, depending on his status with vaccinations and so forth and countries' rules towards that, uh, mark my words, he's going to win his first event back. Yeah, that, that seems like a pretty smart bet. And how he performs, how he doesn't fear anybody, let alone we saw it with Rafa at the French Open last year. And you know he's motivated. Like Nadal might say that he's not really paying attention to the all-time lists. And, and okay, we can take that with a grain of salt. But hey, hey, the best part open. I love, Mitch, I got to interrupt you on this yeah, one. You know, yeah. The best part I used to love between the Nadal-Federer rivalry before Djokovic came up. Roger, he's always too good for me. He's so much better than me. Yeah. But then you look at the head-to-head. -head, who's always leading it. So mm -hmm. I think you've got to always take Rafa with a grain of salt. Yeah, Djokovic has been clearly open about it as well, that he is scoreboard looking and he's he's going on to the next one. We're so. all scoreboard looking. All, all tennis players scoreboard look. They know what everybody's doing. But the question is, can you put it in a compartment and just leave it there for a while? You know, so you, you've, got to, you've got to find the balance. Greg Gruzetsky here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Uh, before we go to the women's side of things, is there anybody else that really impressed you with their performance? I know Felix was one who had Medvedev on the ropes. Uh, Shapovalov did make that quarterfinal. A guy like Matteo Berrettini makes another deep run into a slam. Who else on the men's side really impressed you? Well, I would say probably Ogier Aliassime impressed me the most because you look at the guy and he had match point against Daniil Medvedev. And if he can continue that sort of standard, he can get to where we think he should because he's lost seven straight ATP tour finals. He should have won a title. So for him, winning a title, running deep in the slams. The other guy is Alcaraz, who should have actually beaten Berrettini, in my opinion. You know, he was so, so close to that. So for me, that next generation is coming up. Alcaraz, Ogier Aliassime, and Chapo 
are the three guys that I'm saying, okay, Medvedev's arrived already. Zverev's arrived. CC passed on the cuff. But those three youngsters there, one of those guys has a possibility to be number one, whether it's Auger or whether it's Alcaraz in a few years. And Alcaraz is probably the money that everybody's thinking about at the moment for the ne- in five years' time. Yeah, with his age, especially. I mean, he's still super young, 18 years old, and and has that that lethal power. Was right there, lost that match tie break after coming back. But yeah, I think those are some good picks there. Felix, you got to think that title streak might be, I mean, it's more mental than anything, but it's pretty insane that he's lost seven finals. And this is a top 10 player we're talking about now. I know. I mean, the guy's too good. So obviously, it's got to be mental. It's like the second serve thing that comes out at certain times. But it looks like at this Australian Open, he started to get over the hump. And that's why I always love three out of five set matches, because, you know, you can win tour events, two out of three. But to win the majors, that defines the greatness of players. So I, I hope this year he, he wins his first title because I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. It's too good not to have a title. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, and speaking of the mental side of things, where are we with Alexander Zverev? Because this is kind of becoming an unfortunate trend in majors. He's won multiple Masters titles, multiple year-end championships. He's beaten every tennis player there is in every other setting. But again, can't get it done at the majors. Well, I can't get it done, but he is getting better. I mean, last year I thought was a great season. As you said, start of the year is key. So he didn't have the start that he wanted at the slams, but you got to give Dennis credit for knocking him out. But uh, let's see how he bounced back on the clay. U.S. Open is probably his best shot at winning a title. And, uh, you know, we always think of things as because he was the chosen guy. Let's, when he was 18, 19, right. he's going to be a number one player. No question. He's got too much game. Medvedev shown up, Tsitsipas, Alcaraz. Now it gets more difficult every year. And that U.S. Open finals against Dominic Team. imagine if he would have won that. Would that have changed his trajectory at the moment? So he's still got those questions to answer. But if you look at what he's achieved in his career still to date and all that stuff he's had to deal with off the court as well to play so well has been pretty impressive. That's a good point, by the way, that we anointed him. And it's not the first time in tennis or in sports when you're like, oh, this is the guy it has to be. And he's turned into a phenomenal player. But you never know. I mean, there's a there's a lot of players that in that age group that have stepped up. And, you know, that's got to weigh on him to the expectations. But I'm with well, you still. He's still super young, what, 25 years, two years old. So let's give him. Yeah, but the other thing is he's, he's won the ATP finals, end of season finals, two occasions already. How mm-hmm. many people have done that without winning a slam? You know, he's yeah. he's this close. If he finishes his career and doesn't get at least one major, he will be super disappointed. But he's still got another five years to do it. But every year he gets asked that question. So I'm sure yeah. he just wants to win that slam so he doesn't have to talk to us or answer that question again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's turn our attention to the women now where it was Ashley Barty ending the streak, the 40-year-plus streak of no Aussie winning that title. She gets her third slam, beats Danielle Collins in straight sets. In a quintessential Ash Barty match, had dominant serving, had a 5-1 comeback where she wins in dominant fashion in the tie break. And uh, I, I just really love the reaction, too. It was the primal scream of, like, I did it, I ended this streak, and I and I dug in. Her serve is one thing. that That has been just so impressive, Greg. But just her mentality of handling this pressure, handling this adversity. It's that workman-like, some would say Australian-like approach. She just put her head down and played, and it was very, very fun and impressive to watch. Well, you have to be comfortable in yourself, your tennis. Everything has to be in sync because playing at a home slam is probably the most difficult thing, especially for an Australian or for a British tennis player, even American playing at the U.S. Open. I mean, it's the most difficult thing to win your home slam because all the pressure – all the expectation is there. And how do you manage those things? She basically rifled through the draw. The only hiccup was 5-1 down. And then, as you said, she did the Barty thing and found a way to come back because Collins was playing great up to 5-1. But uh, this is where a Barty's life experience, I think you have to look at the whole story. She started off as a double specialist, wasn't enjoying tennis, went away from the game, went on to play professional cricket. I mean, she's a phenomenal athlete you know, playing professional cricket, professional tennis. Then on top of that, she's a a scratch golfer, comes back to tennis, becomes world number one, wins two majors, and then ends the drought as the first Australian woman in 44 years to do so. And also she's always looking to get better in her game. Her backhand's improved. That's a shot 
that used to be a weakness. She changed her strings in a racket to get more power with that got added to the strings as well. So she's always looking to get better. And her team has been consistent since her comeback as well. It's been the same people there throughout as well. The team point that you just made, very interesting and, and astute to bring that up because there's other players, some pretty high profile in your own neck of the woods that yeah. have been switching team members, but that consistency, that continuity, even going back to Rafa, you know, he makes very minimal moves on his team because he trusts who he's with and, and it is a process. I just, I, the backhand too, I mean, it's very rare to see a player slice as much as she does. I was looking at the numbers. It's like more than three out of four times she's going to that slice and you could tell she frustrates the opponents, but handling the nerves, Collins was, it made a great run, very impressive. She's now the top ranked American woman, but the nerves got to her. I mean, her serve went away from her at times in that match. And it's a lot of pressure, regardless of who you are to play in a slam final, let alone having the crowd on your support, but the crowd behind you. But this is now three slams. This is officially the apex predator of the WTA. We haven't seen that top player take the mantle and it's clearly Ash Barty. She doesn't have much more to prove. And she doesn't. And, you know, if we look at Miami last year, we were saying, oh, well, soccer should be the number one. It shouldn't be Barty. Look at the results. And Barty has just stepped up. And one thing you talk about the slice backhand, a certain woman by the name of Steffi Graf had the best slice backhand yeah. variety. If you've got variety, she volleys exceptionally well, Barty, because of all the doubles she was playing previously as well. So she's got the full package. And a lot of the female tennis players don't always see that short slice, deep slice, defense, movement, attack, all that sort of thing. So it, it's very off-putting, but let's give a lot of credit to Collins for making her first slam final. What a great story from an American point of view as well. And it's great to show what hard work, perseverance, and doing the right things can do. The depth of the women's game is very impressive, and you're starting to see it with just the number of different women that have made semifinals and finals. But there was, as you said, nothing fluky about how Collins got here, how she rose through the draw and just dismantled most of the people in her way. But running into Ash Barty, I mean, it's it's as tough of a task in tennis right now. Three slams, Aussie championship. I mean, I'd say she gets a statue, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> I think she's going to get a statue, but she probably wait until she retires. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, she's only got one more, the U.S. Open, and then she's got a, all, all four in the cabinet, which is an amazing, amazing feat. And, you know, what I love about it is she, she's the sort of Australian hero you love to love. She, yeah. she has all the values, all the great men's and women's champions of the past and and uh, couldn't be more happy for her yeah and i don't think the end is in sight uh, the way she plays her all-court game her youth the fact that she comes from that doubles background is only going to help her going forward and you know it's good to see i'm always a fan of people that play differently too so the fact that she's not only the best but has a style that we don't see is also cool to watch as well yeah but the other thing as well as which i love about Barty, which we don't talk about enough Tennis is always the most important thing for her. Yes, she has other things she enjoys outside of the court to do. We don't see her always doing loads of fashion shoots, getting distracted from the day job. You know, she focuses on, I want to be number one. I want to win slams. And my personal life is my personal life. She's not into papers promoting herself for other things. She has that core of what's the most important thing for her. And that's why we talk about her distancing herself from the rest right now there's her and then there's the rest trying to catch her at the moment one of the things going forward out of this tournament aside from ash barty is that we saw a lot of players that struggled early that might have higher rankings we're going to see a lot of rankings movements naomi osaka is going to be down to around 80 or so i don't know what that's going to mean in terms of how she's going to attack the season i know draws are going to be a lot more challenging but it's kind of something that we have to get used to. Serena's going to be far down the rankings. Osaka, there's a lot of movement. Cannon was another one that lost all these points. So going forward, the, the seeds, the draw, the rankings are going to be a little different. It's going to be interesting to see who can work their way back up. Well, the other thing is I'm sure Ash Barty doesn't want to play Osaka in the opening match oh. or Serena in oh. the opening draws of tournaments. So I always think it's kind of like a box of chocolates. It's such a variety and a mixture. You don't know what you're going to get. And when you have so many great players that rankings have fallen off, it, it brings intrigue. I mean, remember when Serena dropped down to 80 years ago and then she got all the way back up to number one and was winning slams again. Oh. You know, it takes a massive, massive feat to do that. The other thing which has been interesting on the women's, 
is Darren Cahill's changing of, of player as well. Yeah. You know, and he's had instant success. So the coaching merry-go-round on the women's tour is going to happen. And the players also with those big names out there is going to make the early round matches for the public and the WTA so much more interesting. Any Samova's win over Osaka, maybe the most impressive singular match that I saw outside of the Barty run. It was a, a great, great to see her back. She's again, super young as well. Um, but then you also had the, uh, certain other storylines that work well. Madison Keys, who's finally getting back to playing her Apex game. I think that's a top 10 player game-wise. She's mentally engaged. The run to the semis, Greg, and then no shame in losing to Ash Barty. That was very big for her confidence going forward. It was. And, you know, I'd love to see, uh, you know, one of your, your tennis channel uh, analysts there and Lindsay Davenport. I wonder if she's still helping out a little bit because I thought that partnership was a great partnership. And Lindsay is one of the best in the game. So I was really happy to see Kesey playing so well. But I want to see her one day take that hump. Does she believe she can win a major? I think she has the tools to do so. And she's getting that belief back. And if she could get that tactical astutement, even better than it has been in Australia, she's got a shot. And, you know, the older you get in your career, this is where you have to reflect and say, okay, who's going to help me to take that next step? And do I believe I can win a major? Because game-wise, for many, many years, we've always thought that Madison Key should be able to at least grab one major. Yeah, we'll see if it comes now, but she's yeah. definitely playing some of the best tennis in her career. And then the last thing, you had to know this was coming, being where you are, but where are we with Emma Raducanu? She wins a match over Sloan Stevens, but loses in the second round. It's going to face a lot more pressure. She's the, the, the hunted now, not the hunter in a lot of respects. What have you seen? What have you liked? What have you not liked from her going forward and into 2022? Well, you've got to remember, this is a girl that's gone from zero to superstardom overnight. Two slams, she wins the US Open, only qualifier, male or female, to do so. Um, I think if you look at the way she's played, there's some good signs it's coming together. This is going to be the hardest nine to 18 months in her whole career coming up right now. So players are desperate to beat her. It's getting used to playing tennis and being accustomed to handling all that pressure. Once she figures that out, I think 2023 will be her year where she's solidly in the top 10 and then pushes forward. This year is going to be tough. Imagine what Wimbledon is going to be like this year. I mean, you think down under the expectations, we're going to be going bananas. And if she doesn't win everything, everybody's saying, well, she's not any good. She's a one hit wonder, which I think is totally unjust because she's too good of what she's achieved so far in her career. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point to make. And you're not, you're not the only one in the tennis world to make that point that this could be the year where she finds herself and finds her game, even if the results and the rankings aren't there, that she's still super young and will be setting herself up. You do have to think about that too, right? Like there's a lot of players, obviously take players like Serena out of it, but it takes them that year, two years to really find their game and the results come, but they need that that growing pain year before. She's like, she's hasn't even played a full tour season yet, which is the craziest part about all of it. She's going to be experiencing new stuff for the first time. Well, I mean, your first title is the U S open. She doesn't want a WTA title. Yeah. I mean, you can't even compare it to Serena or Venus. I mean, they have been since they were 11, 12 or 13, we've been talking about them for years upon years upon years. So you can't put the Emma Raducanu in that category. I mean, you can almost put nobody in that category of what those two champions have done. So let, let's give her a break. I was doing a little bit of breakfast television during the Australian Open, and they're like, if she doesn't win it, she's a one-hit wonder. And I'm like, stop being ridiculous. And the other thing is, we talked about coaching. Make sure you keep a consistent team from physical trainer to tennis coach over the next time to guide yourself through. That was the main concern is when she split with her coach, who she won the U.S. Open with, she's had a few trials before deciding on obviously Kerber's old coach. And now it's to hopefully stay the distance, get the consistency, do the work, improve yourself tactically. And technically she's sound. I mean, yes, the second serve at times has a little bit of a problem, but that's more mental than technical in my opinion. A couple more things with Greg Gruzetsky here on Tennis Channel Inside In. It was a uh, exciting Australian Open. Uh, the only other note I have on that is, I guess, Nick Kyrgios is a is a double specialist champion now. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun to see him and Kakanakis go on that run and see the crowd support. I'm with you. I'd like to see him, you know, devote that time to singles. But that doubles run was something special and something different we don't normally see in tennis. It's great when you get two singles guys playing together against the very best doubles player in the world. 
There's a wonderful picture of the two youngsters playing junior Wimbledon together that they posted on social media. And to see them win the Australian Open at home, what a moment. Maybe this will inspire Nick. And for Kokonakis, winning in Adelaide to start your home tournament after all the injuries had, and then to win a Grand Slam title in doubles, I'm so, so happy for him because he deserves it through all the injuries he's been through. And Nick, please, please put it together. Do the work. I don't know deep down if he wants to put those four or five hours in daily to get where he belongs. But if he does one day, you know, it'd be great for our sport. Yeah, Kyrgios might get a lot of the press in the pub, but what Kakinakis has been through needs a lot of respect because he's dealt with more injuries than just about anyone. He's really grinded, got the title at home soil and singles and now doubles. It's great to see. A couple other things I wanted to get to. Roger Federer, the other guy in the big three we haven't discussed, uh, has gone kind of public with his battle from injury. says we're going to know a lot more about April, how he's feeling as he's starting to kind of work out again. He's committed to playing in the Labor Cup, at least doubles with Rafa in London in September. Roger Federer's end is in sight. I think even he would acknowledge that. But are you surprised by the process, any of the developments here, or are we just supposed to kind of wait and see, take that old wait and see approach? I think it's wait and see. I mean, we'd love to see Roger at Wimbledon because, you know, Roger always said, I'm not going to play when I don't feel I can win slams anymore. And I still think deep down, he wasn't healthy and he still made the quarters of Wimbledon. You know, you got to think of that, okay? Most players, if you make a quarters of a major, you're like pretty, pretty psyched about it. You're thinking I'm top eight in the world right now, playing great tennis. For Roger, if he's not winning it, he's in trouble. So fingers crossed in April, he says, I'm healthy enough to give Wimbledon a go. And the Labor Cup, you got to remember, that's something that himself and his agent basically came up with the idea to develop the Labor Cup. So that's something very special in his heart to play. So as long as he's playing, whether it's Labor Cup or anything, I'll be pleased. But to win majors, the only one I think he still has a shot if he's healthy or semi-healthy is Wimbledon. You know, we'd have that crowd support. You know that, you know, the points being shorter and what he's done on that surface and and there is is special. But yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, he's coming off of a lot of surgeries, the the biggest ones of his career recently. So we'll have to wait and see and just appreciate any moment that we see Federer on the court. Uh, Speaking of somebody that's trying to come back and almost there, Dominic Team, Greg, who still isn't quite there, said there was some pain in in his knuckles area with all the wrist surgeries and and hand surgeries he's had to have. But he seemed pretty optimistic that the return is in sight. He's getting up there for his terms and age. He's going to be 29 this year as someone that's won a slam and I know you rolled your eyes because it's not, you know, ancient. Hey, it's not like my generation, 29. When you're 29, you're doing yeah. the third in bonus time. I mean, look at Rafa, 35. I know. I just, the, the, any, 34. Any, any injury is going to, any injury seriousness is going to give me pause. But, you know, the hand people get a little sensitive with that. But should we expect team to be playing some top flight tennis and, you know, return back to that top 10, top five level? Yeah, no question about it. If the wrist allows him to do so. Why not? Because you got to remember with a wrist injury, he can be in the best shape in his life. So he can still do all his running on court, off court. He can do his lifting. He can do everything. So he should come back in phenomenal shape. And he's not a guy who's afraid of hard work. And you know, he's doing everything he has to. So when he says I'm back, he'll be back. And uh, nobody will want to see him in a draw, especially on the clay courts. No, that's a, it's a good point. I mean, he was the second best clay court player, second or third for the last five or so years with what his results were. And if anything, he works too hard. They have to drag him off the court. So I expect him to come back to a high level. And he is somebody that has the belief that he can beat these top players. Uh, another guy coming back, Juan Martin Del Potro. I know. I know we've been waiting on that one, but it's been, oh. it's been a long road and it's been one that, you know, tennis fans, Everybody seems to agree upon the fact that he's just a great guy and that they want to see him back out there. And, you know, he's done so much for the sport, but it's been a brutal road to get here. And, and much like Federer, I'm just appreciative of the fact that he's back onto a tennis court. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see Juan Martin, one of the nicest guys in our sport. As Uncle Tony said himself, if he was healthy, he would have been there in the conversation of big three or big four. He was that good when he beat Roger at the U.S. Open going back a few years. And I think no matter what he does, he doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. It's basically to himself. I think he's missed the sport. He's been through so many difficult times that it doesn't matter whether he wins or loses. It's just great to see Delpo back. Yeah, that, I mean, I I keep going back to that 2009 U.S. Open, which was some of the most unconscious tennis of all time, the forehands he was hitting in that match. And 
everybody rivals to fans alike are just willing to, you know, are, are just so grateful that he's going to come back out of the court and, you know, doing it in South America is a very important thing as well. Uh, the tennis calendar is going to roll on. And we know one thing is that there's a documentary crew following them around. Cause what about the timing of that, Greg Netflix just happens to, you know, sign on board in Australia and then everything happens like no stones unturned. I know. I mean, you, you couldn't ask for more drama because obviously everybody knows the formula one drive to survive documentary, which they did, which was brilliant. And then after that, they've signed up tennis and golf this year. So, uh, you know, you couldn't start with more drama down under with Djokovic and the whole situation. And then, you know, history being made with 21 slams, an Australian lady in Ash Barty winning the title in 44 years. I can't wait to see it because we need these sorts of documentaries to bring more fans to our sports. I mean, to be quite honest, I was bored with Formula One. And then I see Drive to Survive and it makes me want to watch cars going in circles. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So... I think this is great for a sport and something that needed to happen. Players have bought into it. I think everybody is, is supportive of the fact and, and showing more personality is good. Just getting back to the final point of that is we were talking about it. It's great to have the humanitarians like Roger and Rafa, but you kind of need those other personalities in the game and, and just to kind of learn and, and, you know, showcase that for tennis is a good thing. So I'm excited to see where this tennis season goes one month in and we've already just exploded <laughs> out onto the scene. Well, don't forget, we, whenever Djokovic shows up, there's another explosion coming up again as well, too. Oh, I can't and, wait. And that, we talked about the ladies' rankings with all the big names that are going to be 80. Can you imagine Barty comes back, first match comes back after the Australian Opens against Serena Williams or Naomi Osaka in the first round? Talk oh. about another blockbuster to open up. So you have so many great storylines, and that's what we need. Because, you know, talk about personalities. For me, why do I love tennis? McEnroe, Borg, Connors, Lendl, those sorts of guys – in the 1980s, those guys were the biggest superstars on the planet. Everybody was on the front cover of every magazine. The guy would say, I don't like him. I don't like this person. You know their personal life. You know everything. It was, it, was, it was exciting. And we need to bring that because there's such a big marketplace now in sports and entertainment. And this hopefully will deliver that. And to start off, the storylines have arrived in 2022. I'm excited. Can't see where we're going to go. Can't wait to see where we're going to go from here. Greg Ruzetsky. Appreciate you coming on the show as always. Uh, blast talking tennis with you here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Best of luck going forward, and uh, we'll catch you on Amazon Prime and other tennis media outlets. But thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me.